you drive south out of Phoenix on the I-10 for about two hours, you'll end up in Tucson. Just before you get there, you'll find Marana, Arizona, a tiny desert town that, as illogical as it sounds, has two airports. One, as you would expect, is very small and caters to light private airplanes and flight schools, and even as a restaurant. The other one is the Pinal Air Park, one of about half a dozen commercial aircraft storage facilities in the desert southwest. A lot of people call this place a boneyard, and although there's no shortage of gargantuan, wide-body airliner carcasses lined up in the dirt in varying states of disrepair, Pinal is really about a 50-50 split between part-out teardown operations and long-term storage. Its permanent residents, typically parked way out in the desert, haven't seen a runway in decades. The bulk of their components carefully scavenged by a teardown crew and later devoured by an aging fleet of sister ships in active service around the world. The front line, however, is primarily composed of midlife and sometimes even fairly new aircraft that are between lease deployments or just not presently in demand. As you can imagine, the pandemic has really contributed to a huge influx of aircraft fitting this mold. The arid climate here is ideal for preserving the mechanical integrity of these complex machines when properly stored because moisture is an idle airplane's worst enemy. Corrosion, mold, even wildlife pose a threat to continuing airworthiness, so asset owners with intentions of placing their aircraft back into flyable condition flock to places like Pinal where they not only have the ability to preserve aircraft, but also to resurrect them through a return to service maintenance event. Because our job primarily involves aircraft deliveries and returns, we are frequent visitors to Marana and other similar facilities, both domestically and abroad. Roughly 60% of our flights start or end at a desert storage facility, and today's mission is one of them. This 17-year-old Airbus A319 had been in storage for about a year and a half. She certainly wasn't new, but still had strong engines and a fair bit of life left in her. Our job is to fly her the 6,600 nautical miles across the Atlantic Ocean to Zagreb, Croatia, where she'll join a fleet of other airby operating for a Croatian airline called Trade Air. As far as ferry flights go, a Western US to Eastern European transatlantic haul is pretty straightforward, even for a narrow-body Airbus built for four to five hour domestic flights. Devoid of passenger or cargo payload, an empty A319 can fly for about seven hours comfortably, meaning that Europe is normally within reach from the Northeast US. Unfortunately, this particular jet lacked a high-frequency HF radio and a satellite data link required for operating in the track system, you know, those highways in the sky where a continuous stream of transatlantic traffic is organized into efficient lines. We'd have to stay north of and below this airspace on the flight, so two fuel stops, one in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and one in Keflavik were in order. People always ask, do you get nervous taking these airplanes out of the desert after they've been sitting? The answer is no, and that's because a lot of work goes into reactivating an airplane coming out of storage. Also, the regulator, FAA in this case, inspects both the plane itself and its maintenance records before issuing the ferry permit. Honestly, we expect there to be some minor issues with airplanes returning to the sky after a long rest. Modern airliners all have redundant systems and backups, and there are procedures in place for making flights with certain things inoperative. This comes in especially handy in our line of work. Shortly after takeoff, the airplane alerted us of an issue. The main fuel tanks, located in the wings, are divided into inner and outer tanks separated by a valve. This helps reduce wing flutter by keeping some of the heavy fuel out along the outer wing until it's needed. This system malfunctioned and the valves failed open, which is a good thing. If the valves failed closed, we'd have been unable to access that fuel and would have needed to make more stops along the way. We always build the flight schedules backwards from whatever time the customer wants the airplane to arrive at the destination. Because we're normally dropping the airplane off at a maintenance hangar, we plan to arrive during the day when they're well staffed. When we cross the Atlantic eastbound, that means we typically plan the crossing at night. With a 3 p.m. departure from Arizona, the sun set for us about three hours into the flight.
Unless the trip we're working is north-south, we always have to deal with either abnormally short or extremely long days and nights. This is obviously because we're either tracking with or against the Earth's rotation. During the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, the further north you travel, the longer the day. In Iceland, between May and July, it doesn't get dark at all. On this trip, we got less than five hours of darkness total. A night landing in Portsmouth, a 45-minute quick turn for customs and fuel, and then a nighttime departure bound for Kef. Now, I don't fully understand this, but for some reason, always during that brief period of darkness, time, it gets all weird. Naturally, and regardless of how rested you are, in the dark, the mind begins to tire. Knowing this is coming, we try to keep busy. We take turns walking around in the back, the empty, silent, motionless cabin, rhythmically illuminated in red from the reflection of our beacon. We caffeinate repeatedly. We make small talk, play games on the iPad. With nothing to see out the window, it's boring. Like, really boring. I look at my watch. Is it stopped? No, wait, is it? How did I just walk to the back four minutes ago? And why do I have to pee again? And then, there's the horizon again. The morning colors, just putting the sunset to shame as always. The distant lightning that I was just starting to get concerned with, I can now see that we're way above all that. And the blazing sun, only moments away. Get ready. We just passed 45 degrees west, so we're over the southern tip of Greenland. You wouldn't know it though, because it's pretty rare that this part of the world isn't blanketed by an overcast cloud layer. More coffee. Scratch that, it's cold. This time I'll go with a Red Bull. Ugh, I hate Red Bull. When crossing the ocean, we're not on anybody's radar screen. We're totally on our own. The oceanic waypoints are defined by latitude and longitude coordinates, lat longs. And every time we cross one, essentially about every hour, we call up ATC and tell them where we are and what time we expect to cross the next waypoint. At 30 West, we give our last position report because we're about to appear on Keflavik Control's radar screen. All right, Steve, get your shit together. We're there. Time to turn off the audiobook. Talk to you later, Obama. You definitely want to double and even triple check the weather conditions in Kef. Things change fast there. Sometimes it's gorgeous, and today, it was really pretty nice for Iceland. Still, though, the airport is located right along the coast, and there's virtually always a marine layer. So we briefed up the ILS a precision approach that's capable of bringing us in from almost 20 miles out to 200 feet above the runway before we have to be able to see it visually. The autopilot still has control of the airplane, but instead of getting its instructions from the flight management computer, it's now responding to commands that we, the pilots, give by dialing in heading, vertical speed, and airspeed commands to the flight guidance control panel. The amount of time we actually fly the Airbus, in the traditional sense, is minimal. 
Normally, we're managing it. But for the last two, three minutes of any flight, you get to fly. Unlike most other airliners with a yoke, the Airbus is flown with a side stick. For some reason, this is a polarizing topic for pilots, but I don't understand why. The stick is great. Once we touch down at 120 knots, we quickly slow to taxi speed and I transition my left hand from the stick to the tiller, a little handle that turns the nose gear when taxiing. Normally, the Keflavik airport is bustling with activity early in the morning. As the major hub for Iceland Air, the airport serves up non-stop flights to points all over the world. Since the pandemic, however, the place is basically a ghost town. We open the main cabin door and the cool Icelandic morning air rushes in. Just as the nighttime oceanic crossings always seem to suck the life out of you, the hour-long break in Keflavik always functions as a shot of adrenaline right into the heart. As the ground handling team from South Air starts uplifting 5,000 gallons of jet fuel, Bob and I head inside to change up the scenery for a little while. What's up, man? How's your coffee? I'm my coffee. It's hot. <laughs> it's very hot. It's That's very good. good. You want milk? Yeah, I want to get it. Oh. <sighs> All right, let's... Somebody a Dude, people fly like Cessnas. I never signed this, do you? No. You should. <laughs> I, I used to a long time ago. <laughs> Actually, that somebody, uh, I don't know, it was like Flying Magazine had an article about ferry pilots or something doing ferry flights. Right. And it was, it was mostly about small airplanes, you know, you're going to Europe. Right. But they took a picture of the book here and and one of the one of my flights was in here that I I had signed. Oh no kidding! <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah, somebody found it. I mean, I didn't read it. Somebody found it like while reading Flying Magazine or something. Maybe we should uh, maybe we should sign it for the first time in years. <laughs> I'm usually like just so just spent by the time I get here, you know. I mean, it's always it's always a long day by the time you get here, regardless of what direction you're going. Yeah. We usually don't want people to know where we've been. <laughs> this is true. Thanks for the great coffee. Yeah, way to go, Hemingway. So I signed the damn book for the first time, and maybe ever, after probably a hundred times through here, and that's what I finally had to say. Now you see why I never signed the book. We were only actually able to spend about 15 minutes inside, and after paying for the services, it was time to get back on the jet to program the route for the next and final leg. European airspace is busy, and there are easily four times the number of waypoints to enter into the FMC. South Air is always great for giving us a fast and efficient turn, and just like that, we were back underway. After a short taxi out for departure, we blasted out of Kef southeastbound and dodged left around the volcanic plume, a sight we've been witnessing for over a year now. The flight from Kef to Zagreb is normally only about five or six hours with a direct routing, but for us today, things are different. 
Our flight is going to be just short of eight hours and will require we fly clear across the UK, France, and the Mediterranean Sea, where we'll make landfall over the northern coast of Algeria. Then we'll fly along the coastline to Tunis and navigate over Malta, past Sicily, and then finally northbound over the Adriatic Sea into Croatia. this detour? A holiday in Italy. Because of the long weekend leading up to the trip, we didn't have time to get overflight approvals for Italy, so we routed around it. Remember when I mentioned the ferry permit? Well, because the airplane is operating with special permission due to its pending maintenance event, we always need to get overflight approvals to operate over every country individually. This is part of our extensive planning process before a trip begins. hours from the time we release brakes in Marana, we're turning final over Zagreb and lining up for runway four. Neither Bob nor I had ever been to Zagreb before. Weird, right? Definite bonus also that the weather was so clear for our first close-up look at the topography. Approaching from the southwest, the view is mostly pretty rural. Lots of open land, farm fields, and clusters of houses that form small towns on the outskirts of the city. The area was more mountainous than I expected. The visual approach reminded me a lot of arriving into Belgrade, Serbia, which actually makes sense. Belgrade is about 200 miles from here. done with the flying part anyway. Truthfully, it's always a mystery what to expect on arrival with a delivery flight. We've been greeted with water cannons, ceremonies, with bands. Sometimes nobody's there at all. We get off the airplane with no idea how to get a hold of whomever is supposed to meet us. In this case, the CEO of Trade Air was there personally to meet us. Marco is actually an Airbus-rated pilot himself, and get this. He not only runs the airline, but also works as a Czech airman training the line pilots and even flying trips sometimes. Just a super smart, interesting guy. And as it turns out, we made a new friend in Croatia. Marco ended up taking us out to dinner later that night and showed us around the city for a while. It is weird that of all the places that we've been on Earth, that we we, uh, have not been to uh, Croatia previously. been banned for 20 years. <laughs> We've just lived in the band. And... Allow me to digress for a minute. Anyone who's spent time with me knows that my default answer to the scariest thing about my job question is always the taxis. <laughs> it's true though, think about it. The rest of it is a situation that I can control, but not the taxi. Have you seen the streets in India? Brazzaville, hell, Paris? I guess the fear of taxis is a strange phobia to have, especially for someone who lives life on the road. Maybe it's something that's a direct result of living this crazy traveling life. I don't know. There have literally been 50 taxi-related incidents. More if you count Bob's rental car accidents. Like, just a month ago, this happened. So what's going on, man? We're not really sure. We just got pulled over by some pseudo cops or, or something. I don't know. The driver's getting harassed. As you can see, it's complete chaos. Well, here comes another one now. 
they're just randomly stopping cars. We've already stuffed all the cash and passports that we have into our pants. <laughs> there is a guy selling waffles. <laughs> Not a not a fucking great situation. Um, we have to catch a flight in about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> We're very possibly going to miss if this doesn't get resolved soon. What time is it right now? I don't know. Let's see. As you can see, there are just, I mean, people, traffic. This is just a typical Kinshasa day it's on the five, street. It's five o'clock. We've got three hours before our flight leaves. But of course, this is a two-hour drive. Not today, though. Actually, the ride to the hotel was very pleasant and quite fast. We barely had time to check social media. <laughs> Doesn't he? He kind of looks like Kling Hopper. Yeah. We're watching Roger Victor. <laughs> a video of a video. A Well, just got to the hotel here in uh, Zagreb and uh, just going to grab some beers and some dinner. It is 8.30 p.m. right now. And, uh, and then I'm going to come back and take a cat nap before I have to get up for my flight. 4 a.m. I have to leave the uh, hotel here. Flight's at 6.25 and I have to get another COVID test, although I have one. Um, uh, going to Amsterdam to get home and they require uh, a same-day test at the airport. So... Um, my flight departs in seven and a half hours, but um, I think it's I think it's still a good time to, to grab a bite to eat and see the local sites. We didn't have long, and I didn't see much, but what I did see convinced me that I need to come back here. After a quick change of attire, we met up with Marco, who was sharply dressed in stark contrast to our grunge look. He showed us around town in the remaining minutes before sunset, and after the last year and a half of COVID lockdown, I can't describe how refreshing it was to see this level of public activity. We settled into an outdoor cafe and had some local food and beer. What you got there, Bob? Croatia fries. <laughs> Croatian tacos. Man, beer. They are kind of like tacos. Yeah. I don't know what he say. Well, They're pork. Well, they call them pork sandwiches, but there's chicken, pork. Yeah. I don't know. They're really good. Ah, oh, a nice cold beer. There's nothing better after a long ferry flight than a nice cold beer. Exactly. A cigar would be a little better. Yeah, I definitely need a cigar. And that's pretty much where the story ended for me. A smooth, uneventful trip that got me back home to my family in slightly more than 48 hours from when I left. Crazy. The next morning, I got my third nasal swab of the week and hopped to KLM 737-700 to Amsterdam. It was a short flight and quite pleasant for European business class, which is basically coach, but with food and a shorter line to get off. In Amsterdam, I hopped the non-stopper on American to Philly. These days, they're running a 787 on the route, which is a huge improvement over their now-retired A330s. I slept most of the way back, caught up with the sun, and started doing what I do now, 
you know, editing video. The story wasn't over for old Bob, though. He decided to hang out in Croatia for a couple of days. He gave me the lowdown on his experience and basically said it was one of the coolest places that he'd ever been. We were both really blown away by the place, and I immediately told my wife Avery that we've got to plan a trip to Croatia, specifically the coast. Every single local told us the same thing. Dubrovnik is great, but the coastline is long, and go visit the other coastal cities. You can bet I'll do just that. Anyway, rather than try to narrate Bob's experience, which I wasn't directly privy to, I'll just let the last three minutes of this one play out with his words and thoughts, and his Kentucky pronunciation of the name of the city. Until next time. I'm in Zagreb, Croatia. It's an awesome city. Actually, Croatia is beautiful. I'd love to stay here for about a month or two. Maybe I will one of these days. Here, walking around the city, there's a tunnel. I see people going into, but I have no idea where it goes. I think I'm gonna go try to head down there. I've been walking up this road here in Zagreb. There's a tunnel here. I keep seeing people going into it. I have no idea where it goes. I'm just gonna follow it till it ends, I guess. I can't, came to a couple places I can go. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's fog or smoke down there. I think I'll keep following it straight this way. Because I see people down here. Coming out of a smaller tunnel into a bigger one. I don't know if this is a more modern part of the tunnel or what. Back into a smaller tunnel. It's getting kind of foggy in here. It's kind of creepy. Uh, so Greece is a very safe city. Actually, Croatia is a very safe country. So I'm really worried about kind of exploring around here. And just like that, I'm out. Kind of in a touristy area. That was pretty interesting. Glad I decided to walk through there. That was cool. It's a beautiful city, lots of beautiful architecture, lots of things to see. As you can see from the sign, there's all kinds of directions to go see a number of things. What I wanted to go see was this Museum of Mushrooms. I wonder what that's all about. <laughs> 